We don't need to be living in fear. At the same time, we also have to be aware of what we're putting in our bodies because there are absolutely things that are approved that are on shelves that you could easily grab that can really mess up your liver. You just have to arm yourself with the knowledge to know what they are and how much you should really be looking at taking. I want to jump right into this because I feel like the four compounds that I'm going to talk about are highly, highly discussed, especially online. And a lot of people say, do not take these because of what they do to your liver. I need to clear the air. And although the four compounds that I am going to talk about do have an effect on the liver, I also want to play devil's advocate and look at the other side too, because if they're on the market, they're probably not super dangerous. But on the other hand, is anybody really looking out for us? So let's investigate. And after this video, down below, there is a 40% off link for Four Sigmatic. Four Sigmatic is an organic fair trade coffee along with lion's mane and chaga. So on days when I feel like I just need a little bit more of like productivity and a little bit more mental boost and a little bit more clarity and focus, I use Four Sigmatic. Okay, so all the benefits of the organic fair trade coffee, but then you get the adaptogenic effect with the lion's mane and the chaga, which is again, super good for just getting that focus, getting that productivity, but also chaga is really good when it comes down to immune support. Every single batch is third party tested. That means the quality of the coffee, but also the mushrooms as well. So everything is super tested, which is what I'm all about, making sure that everything is rooted in data and that things are legit. It also helps that they have 20,000 five-star reviews and have a 100% money-back guarantee. So for that 40% off discount, you use that link down below or go to foursigmatic.com slash Delauer. That's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com slash Delauer. And that's where you can get up to 40% off lion's mane and chaga mushroom coffee down below. The first one is kava. Okay, kava tops the charts as something that is questionable when it comes down to liver toxicity. Now, I might spoil this whole thing when I say I take kava and I enjoy taking it. I like how it makes me feel, but that doesn't mean that I didn't do my due diligence. So let me kind of break it down because it's a little bit of a gray area. You just have to know. Okay, first of all, what kava does is it blocks sodium ion channels. Okay, so it blocks a little bit of sodium coming into specific cells. Long story short, it helps kind of cut some of the excitability that might be happening in some of your cells in your brain. Makes you feel a little bit calmer, but it also enhances what's called gamma aminobutyric acid. So it basically makes you feel a little bit calm. It has a mild sedative effect, feels a little bit like, you know, having a drink, but without the um, sort of, I don't know, cognitive decline or, or sort of that portion that we don't really want necessarily. Anyhow, point is, is it's functional and it works. But why is there so much talk about it being liver toxic? Well, there were a bunch of case reports back in like the 90s that ended up leading to it getting banned across a lot of Europe. Now, even some parts of North America had banned it. But then you go 12 years later and some of those bans have been overturned because they said, okay, wait a minute, there's nothing significant showing that there's any independent single cause by kava to really make us take it off the market. So the Chemical Toxicology Journal took a look at 85 independent studies. They took a look at them and they said that there was no indisputable single cause that would make it toxic. So they couldn't really figure out, well, what's the deal? How come we've seen some case reports of people having liver issues with it? Well, long story short, what they kind of concluded was that Kava is perfectly fine. It's just if you have a compromised liver, you might run into an issue. Or if you're consuming a lot of other things like medications and alcohol that might have an effect on your liver, then perhaps it has an effect. But even then, there are some studies that show that, hmm, maybe that's not even the case because kava alongside alcohol doesn't even seem to have a huge effect. So what's the deal? What are these case reports about? Well, one big thing that kind of stands out is some people may be genetically unable to metabolize some of the downstream metabolites of kava. But even that's a little bit of a stretch. I think when you really look at the big picture, back in the 90s, when kava gained a lot of popularity, a lot of brands started producing a lot of it and they started cutting corners. So what do they do? They add a lot of the stems and a lot of the leaves and they extract the compound with alcohol. And when you extract with alcohol, you bring a lot of other compounds that might not be in a traditional pure kava form. So as with anything, I hate to sound generic, but you need to go with higher quality kava, okay? Pure 
kava extract versus just straight up kava that might be in the relatively cheapest bottle because then you run the risk of having the stems and the leaves which are probably the most likely trigger for potential liver issues but at the end of the day it's still relatively safe as deemed by the food and drug administration and a lot of other things so anyhow just use some caution there the next one however is one that you do need to be careful with vitamin a vitamin a sounds so docile because it's just a vitamin but it's very easy to overdo it, first of all, because it's fat soluble. And when you're usually taking a vitamin A supplement, it's usually about 10,000 IUs, okay? And a lot of studies have indicated that as little as 20,000 IUs can be enough to trigger some hepatic toxicity, trigger some issues with your liver. What it does is it causes a mild elevation of your liver enzymes like ALT, AST, but you also end up with what is called portal hypertension. You have the portal vein in your liver, okay? And that portal vein is very important for delivering things to the metabolism ultimately, right? Delivering things to the bloodstream and just important parts of our metabolism. When it is hypertensive, it's usually because it's getting a little bit of fibrosis and you're not having that flexibility to the artery or flexibility to the portal vein as much as you normally would. That's a bad sign because it indicates some fibrosis, which again is another potential thing we see with a lot of vitamin A is progressive fibrosis, almost like a form of cirrhosis where the liver is just getting hardened and is losing its ability to perform as well. Basically what happens is vitamin A in high amounts down regulates what's called collagenase. Okay, collagenase would stop collagen from forming uh, too much. When collagen forms too much, you end up with this fibrotic tissue. Okay, and that's exactly what we're looking at here. Not to mention vitamin A can also have an effect on how the mitochondria within the liver process things, process energy. So actually at a cellular like metabolic energy root, it can affect the liver. So what's the deal here though? Can you overconsume it easily? The short answer is yes, you can. And depending on how much you take, the body can really absorb it. I do not recommend taking a vitamin A supplement unless your doctor has really recommended it. You look at things like Accutane, which is high concentrated vitamin A, high dose, and look at how toxic that stuff is. It's very dangerous. They don't let you consume alcohol, take other medications, go out in the sun, do lots of things, right? So how do you get potential vitamin A? Because it is good for the eyes. It is good for just lots of things like retinol A is gonna be good for. But I would recommend going the cod liver oil route. Okay, so cod liver oil is going to be rich in bioavailable vitamin A as well as bioavailable vitamin D, which have some feedback loops together and allow themselves to kind of work in tandem. Plus it's a lot harder to overdo it, not to mention you're getting a high amount of omega-3s, which kind of have an anti-inflammatory effect, which may have a potential effect at controlling some of those liver issues as well. So go with the cod liver oil instead of direct vitamin A, unless you've been specifically told to do so by a medical professional. This next one is intriguing, okay? It's green tea extract. There is some fluff going around the internet saying that green tea extract in high amounts is not good. Well, first of all, anything in extreme amounts probably isn't good because it's gonna throw things out of balance. But what happens is with green tea and green tea extract, you are isolating what are called catechins. Catechins are not designed to be independently used, okay? So you look at things like EGCG, I love EGCG, I talk about it. It's called epigallocatechin 3 gallate It is the primary catechin that has powerful, well, indirect antioxidant effects within the body. Okay, it's beneficial when we're fasting, it's beneficial when we're dieting. Okay, but here's the problem. When you have it in high amounts, like over like 200 milligrams, you can trigger an effect on the liver that is not very good. Here's how it works. Epigallocatechin 3 gallate converts into something called epicatechin gallate within the liver. Epicatechin gallate is an oxidative stressor. It triggers a little bit of oxidative stress so that the body overcomes it and builds resiliency. Just like fasting triggers oxidative stress and our body overcomes it and develops our own antioxidants. So there's a very fine line, right? A small amount of EGCG, like you would normally get in like a couple servings of green tea, triggers just enough stress to build resiliency and allow your liver and your body to get stronger. It also comes with its own natural supporting antioxidants that might stop that epicatechin gallate from going overboard. It's kind of got a governor on it. So green tea in a natural form just makes way more sense because, well, 
It just does. You're getting it in a whole form. But that doesn't mean that green tea extract is bad. You just have to be careful with what it's combined with because some of these like botanicals and things like that can be hepatoxic as well. So just pay attention to it and try not to exceed like 200 milligrams of straight up EGCG. Try to keep it like 50-ish. That's a perfect amount and it's still going to get you the powerful effect. A lot of fat burners abuse it. And I have to wrap up with one that's very important and that is milk thistle. People tend to think that because milk thistle has a liver cleansing effect, that it's going to be liver toxic. Not quite the case. In fact, a lot of both sides are inconclusive. Here's how it works. Milk thistle is really good at sort of reducing liver enzymes in mice, but not heavily proven in humans. And the method of action or the mechanism of action is intriguing. Researchers originally thought it had powerful antioxidant capabilities, but it ends up not being the case so much. I was a fan of milk thistle for a long time, and then I kind of go on and off taking it. But here's how it actually works. It increases gene expression of genes that increase the right kind of stress within the liver. Ultimately, once again, building resiliency. We don't want a weak liver. We want a strong liver, but we don't want to stress it so hard that it dies, right? So it induces gene expression for the proper stressors. Okay, and then it turns down and suppresses gene expression for ongoing inflammation. So in the short term, it helps the liver get stronger. And in the long term, it can potentially modulate inflammation. It also induces AMPK, which allows the liver to kind of go into a recycling mode and reduces mTOR, which could potentially stop the growth of some lesions and everything like that. Okay, again, phenomenal results in mice studies, but there was a meta-analysis that took a look at 17 different studies and was published in the World Journal of Gastroenterology and found there's pretty much no effect in humans. Well, how can that be? Because really it's pretty similar physiology with a mouse liver and a human liver. Bottom line, it comes down to dose. What they tell you to take in the amount of milk thistle is probably not enough. And most of the studies, and even these studies that actually showed this, the researchers flat out said there were way too many variables to really see if this was effective. The researchers deep down, seems like they still felt that milk thistle was pretty effective. So when you look at the mechanism of action and how it works, I would hypothesize that it probably would work in humans. It just needs to be at a higher level because the reduction of ALT and the reduction of AST in mice is pretty significant. But again, the dose dependent effect plays a big role. So as always, I know that this was a lot of information, but take with it what you can. Kava in moderation, cod liver oil instead of vitamin A, green tea instead of straight green tea extract, unless it's like under, realistically, under 100 milligrams, okay? And then milk thistle, take a little bit more than what's probably listed if you wanna actually get an effect. So as always, I'll see you tomorrow.